we are in his congressional district and we've asked him to greet the summit and introduce the man who formerly represented the congressional district. I was also reminded earlier that it would be appropriate that everyone currently serving or who has in the past served in the armed forces of our country would stand and be recognized and applaud them and applaud Congressman Mike Kaufman as he comes to the platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to be with you, and, and thank you, uh, Colorado Christian University, for uh, hosting this, the, this great event for freedom. The, uh, the mainstream media ha has got to classifying those of us who, who oppose the, the, much of the agenda in Washington uh, as being members of the party of no. And uh, uh, Michelle Bachman and I, I think, uh, uh, bear that distinction. And, but, but let me tell you this. If being a member of the party of no means opposing this president's plan to close Guantanamo Bay because he believes that protecting the rights of terrorists is more important than protecting the lives of Americans, then let me be a member of the party of no. If, if, if being a member of the party of no means voting against an unconstitutional takeover of our healthcare system, then let me be a member of the party of no. If being a member of the party of no means being opposed to the reckless spending in Washington that is driving this country deeper and deeper into debt, then let me be a member of the party of no. Our nation is at a crossroads today, and the 2010 election will be a referendum on the direction that America goes down, and it's whether we will go down uh, a path of individual liberty and respect for the free enterprise system that has built the prosperity of this nation, or whether we will become a European-style welfare state centered around group rights. That is the consequence of this uh, upcoming election, and it is an honor to me today to introduce somebody who has been at the center of that fight, who has been a soldier in the fight for liberty, someone who began their working life as a, a classroom teacher, and then in 1976 in Colorado decided to run for the state legislature, where he quickly gained a reputation as a strong conservative where in 1981 he was appointed by President Reagan to head up the a regional office of the Department of Education, where through his, by the end of his tenure in 1992, he cut that staff down from 225 bureaucrats to 60. In 1993, he headed up a, a conservative independent think tank, the Independence Institute in Golden, Colorado. And in 1998, he was elected to the Congress of the United States, where he served until 2008, and he, where he gained a reputation as a strident opponent to George W. Bush's immigration reform policies, and is today and today remains a leader in the fight to secure our nation's border. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to me to introduce my predecessor to you, former Congressman Tom Tancred. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let this be a, a lesson to all of you who are seeking office or may be seeking office, uh, political office. 
If you want this kind of rousing reception when you actually are in front of a crowd of people, here's the, here's the way to get it. Retire. <laughs> I don't know that I ever had such a nice introduction or, or, uh, or reception when I was in the Congress of the United States. But uh, in, in fact, it is, uh, it's, a privilege to, it's a privilege to be joining with you today in this incredibly important and incredibly profound event. Uh, what I have both been able to hear myself and what I expect to be coming here today, I am certainly, um, well, I'm humbled to even be on this stage. Um, before I forget, General Boynton, Boynton, uh, Boynton came, uh, came out with a couple of things that I think you need to really know about, and I want to reiterate because uh, they're very important. One is, I also have a book out there, <laughs> and desperately would uh, love to have you uh, buy one. I'll be happy to sign it. And number two, he mentioned something about the UN and its attack, its coming attack on the Second Amendment. It's a real thing. This is not a joke. We have actually signed, under this administration, we have signed up for, uh, the, it's the beginning, they're putting in, into uh, process um, the development of a small arms limitation treaty. And you know and I know that this administration will use any any opportunity, any way they can to attack, to attack every part of the, what they see to be uh, an America with which they disagree, and an armed America is something with which they disagree. They are going to attack this every way they can, in the courts, in the legislature, or in fact in the United Nations. So outside, there is indeed a petition that you can sign, better yet that you can sign up to take. If we can get about 100,000 signatures, and we're more than halfway there. I'm, I'm really uh, excited to tell you about this, but we're, if you can get 100,000 signatures, if you can help us out, please go out there and sign a petition. It'll be on the ballot. It's Initiative 42, if we can get enough signatures. And it simply tells every elected official of the state of Colorado, especially, of course, those people serving in the Congress of the United States, and even more especially those people serving in the Senate, that they are to never vote for any international protocol or agreement that jeopardizes the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution. So it's out there. Um, so much of what I, I had planned to talk about in terms of my, my, my topic was, I was told to, to talk about who are we uh, as a nation. Because, of course, the battle I have been fighting for years, the battle that was referred to by Mike and others, is the battle that I, I thoroughly enjoy and I, and I believe with all my heart is one of the most important battles we can all join into. And that is a discussion of and a debate upon who we are as a nation. Immigration is only one tiny part of that big thing. I happened to get involved in it because it led, and when I did, it led to more and more of my interest and, and concern about this one question. Who are we? You see, a, a while back, a, a brilliant man, Samuel Huntington, wrote a book by that title, and it had a profound effect on me. And I encourage you all to read that book. He, he died just last year, but he was a brilliant, brilliant Harvard scholar and Olin Fellow, and he had written books before that I had read, and one was called The Clash of Civilizations. And that really got me started down this road. And, and he, what he talked about is the fact that in this new century, the real conflicts will not be a, 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 an ism against another ism necessarily. It will be a clash of civilizations. And where Western civilization stands in that battle and its ability to defend itself will determine the outcome of our world. Because if we lose that battle, in this clash of civilizations, which we are undoubtedly in. No matter how I, often I hear people go, you can't talk about it like that. You can't suggest that's the case because we've got so much diversity now in the country. Well, let me tell you something. Diversity can be a wonderful thing. Diversity can, I enjoy being, you know, having an Italian background. I still take my, my, grandsons, my grandkids now down to the Feast of St. Rocco. You know, down there, my mark, and I must, must admit, I've said before, I, as I get older, I keep thinking, there really was a, a guy named Rocco who became a saint. You know, wonder what he did. But, but, um, but it's been going on for like sixty or more years, and, and I go to, I mean, all that kind of thing, that kind of diversity, no problem. Okay, fine. 
but I'm talking about a much more serious problem. When in the United States of America, because we do have so much diversity, because we come from so many places, so many backgrounds, so many attitudes, ideas, and languages, that it is imperative for us, more than almost any other country in the world, it is imperative for us to have something that ties us together, something that we have in common, because we have so much that differentiates us one from another. And that one thing should first of all be a language, because you see, without it, Without a common language, without a common language, we cannot communicate even our differences. And it does separate cultures. It, it does not help a nation, especially like ours, as I say, to come together on anything. When you are actually balkanizing America, it is happening in front of us. And that's why this thing called diversity can be dangerous. When you claim it's the one thing that holds your country together, there's something a little oxymoronic about that. How can you have the trait of diversity being the most important thing that holds you together or that identifies you as a nation? It is impossible. It does divide us. And then what happens, of course, is the cult of multiculturalism becomes so much more powerful in that kind of a setting. That kind of phenomena has happened all over the world for a long time. Cultures do a, a, you know, their systems and they do attempt to continue themselves wherever they are. And if they move to another place, another land, there's a, there's a natural tendency for that culture to do everything it can to, con to retain all of the aspects of it. But you know what? You, you've got to look at this and think to yourself, why is it so important? Why does everybody exclaim the, the um, value of having other people who come here and, and the importance for them to retain all of the aspects of their culture but attack our desire to retain our own? Why is that even remotely rational? We have something of value, of great value. We are the last hope of Western civilization. This country, Europe has been Islamicized. I have quotes here, I won't have time probably to get into, from Gert Wilders. Gert, Gert Wilders is the head of a political party in the Netherlands. And he speaks eloquently about this. And he talks about, when he came, he says, I, I'll just a paragraph from that. He was here in the United States a short time ago. Garrett Wilders, I come to America with a mission. All is not well in the old world. There's a tremendous danger looming, and it's very difficult to be optimistic. We might be in the final stages of the Islamization of Europe. Not only is it a clear and present danger to the, Europe, uh, to the future of Europe itself, it's a threat to America and the sheer survival of the West. The danger I see looming, he said, is the scenario of America as the last man standing. The United States is the last bastion of Western civilization facing an Islamic Europe. In a generation or two, the U.S. will ask itself, who lost Europe? Patriots from around Europe risk their lives every day to prevent precisely this scenario from becoming a reality. He went on for a, a, a time, and it was a brilliant speech here in the United States. Garrett Wilders is on trial in the Netherlands for hate speech. He can go to jail for this speech and for others he has given in support of Western civilization. And if you don't think that that can happen here, you are wrong. We are looking at a system, we are looking at a, I, I hate to say this, but this cult of multiculturalism has us by the throat. Um, a few years ago, in a place not very far from here, a, a school, a beautiful school ca called Mountain Vista High School, Douglas County, beautiful school, just built, and they asked me to come out and speak, I did. Spoke to the, the 200 and some students who were there at the time. They had just started the school, didn't even have a senior class. But they, were, they had been in, in about six months or so, they had been in session. I, I came in to speak. They brought them all into the auditorium. There were people on each side of the hall. The teachers lined up at the doors, all the kids I mean, along the hall, and all the kids sat here, you know, and we, we started to talk. And, and I said, um, well, you know, this is a brand new school. How do you like this school? Ah, oh, yay! Everybody yelled, screamed. It's wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful school. We love it. You know, they've only been there six months. That's all right. They, they love their school. How do you, I said, how about the team, man? How's it do? Oh, they're great. They're wonderful. They hadn't won a game in six months. Did not matter. It was their team, their school. They were very proud. 
as well they should be. That's kid. You know, I mean, it's also kind of a kid thing. I said, and I don't even know what made me say it, but I said, what do you think about your country? Now, remember, there was all this shouting and joy and happiness and enthusiasm about their school, about their team. I said, what do you think about America? Just like that. Dead silence. Dead silence. And, and I, I, repeated, I repeated it and I said, what, I, you know, I'm asking you a question. Do you like the United States of America, your country? You like your school? You like your, your team? What do you think about America? And they start looking at the, you know, the wall and saying, gee, I don't know, how can I, where is this guy coming from? What's, and they're getting upset. You can see visibly they're getting sort of antsy about this. Looking at the teachers about how, how in the world they can possibly handle this question. First, then finally, a little kid, one kid, you know, sheepishly like this. And I've been a teacher. I know this look in their eye. It's like, oh, God, will he call on me? Oh, I don't, I don't want him to. And the reason why they didn't want to is because I don't think that they all hated America. I just think they were completely and entirely intellectually unable to affirm the proposition that it's a good place. And why? Because of the people that were standing along those walls and the books they were reading in those classes. And I said, and I told them, I said, you know, I, I said, listen, I, I don't have time to disabuse you of all the junk that you've been reading in your textbooks and all the junk that those people have been talking to you about in terms of what America is all about. So let me just do this. Please remember this, I said to them. It says, it says, condensed as I can possibly make this. But when you start wondering about America, when you start reading all the nasty stuff about America, which, is, which permeates every textbook I now see, when, and you listen to every commentator on the, the, the news, and, 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 and these teachers, who, who I, I'm sure there are many of them that are good, fine teachers, but far too many could not possibly articulate the value of America for those kids. You know, even if they wanted to. They don't know it. They didn't understand it. They never went to a school in which it was taught. And they certainly were not given it any place else. I said, but, but when you hear these things, just remember this, please. When you open up the gates all over the world, people run only one way. And that's to the West. You never heard of anybody. I said, do you know of any human being has ever in your whole life, have you ever heard of anybody who has escaped from the West, from the United States or any place else for a better life in, say, Pakistan? or anywhere else for that matter. And so what does this tell you, I said? Please think about it. When people can vote, they vote with their feet. And which way do they run? They all run to the West. This tells you something about the value of Western civilization. Please don't forget about it. And it was the most basic thing I could say. Certainly not terribly theoretical or intellectual, but, but I wanted them to take away that one thought about what, is, what shows you, empirically proves the value of the statement that the West is meaningful. Now, let me tell you. Um, not too long ago, I was driving, I was driving down uh, right by Columbine High School. I was coming home from uh, my, our regional, uh, my office here in Denver when I was in the Congress, and I was driving out to Littleton, and I, and I wasn't too far from Columbine, and, and on the radio I heard a, a report that came in about a, an event that happened in Russia, in a place called North Ossetia, in Russia, and I was just listening to it, and it talked about a a bomb or two that had gone off in an elementary school. And, and the more they talked about it, and I'm going by Columbine, you know what I mean? It's just, I don't know what struck me, but I kept thinking to myself, gosh, you know, this sounds like a horrible thing. And my wife and my wife taught Russian for 27 years. We've been to Russia many, many times. We, had, we, we knew the culture. My wife knows the language. I got home and I said to her, you know, this horrible thing had happened in a place called Beslan. And, and maybe we should try to go. And I really didn't have the, all of the information at the time, but it would just sounded like a terrible thing. And, and maybe because I was a congressman who lived near Columbine High School, and because we had experienced a horrible thing, a horrible event, I could perhaps go there and tell them, you know, give them our condolences and tell them we understand when a horrible thing like that. But I, I actually didn't know all of the facts at the time. I went home and I said to my wife, can we go? Do you, do, do you have time? Can you come with me? And if we can arrange this all, can we get over there pretty quickly? Sure, she said, okay, we can go. So I, I arrange it through the Congress and I, and I we, we take off and we, we get to Moscow and, and the, the Russians don't want us to go to, to Beslan. 
And so they're trying to stall all the time. And, and first they take us to the hospital where all these kids have been brought. And it was the most incredible thing because we, we kept going into rooms and, and seeing these kids that had been hurt, injured. Some had just died in this explosion, these series of explosions in a school in Beslan. And, and, and of course, you remember why, perhaps. What happened? Who did that? You know, these were, these were Islamist terrorists who came into a small little village area, 25,000 people, it's not that small, but it's, it's certainly not a big you know, metropolitan area, came into this town, surrounded this school on, the, on, on uh, September the 1st, which in Russia is the day all kids come back to school, and it's quite celebratory, and their grandparents are there, and it's a lot of, they surround them, they force everybody into this, into this auditorium area of about, I'd say, well, certainly half is just half as large as this room. And they had almost a thousand people. And it became very hot. And, and they, first of all, the first thing they did was shoot every man and young man. And they did it in front of the kids and all of the people that they had pushed into this room. They shot them all in a little hall, in a, in a kind of an alleyway, and everybody could see it. And, and then they, they put everybody in this room, and it was about 100 degrees, and people were dying and children were, were dying and, and, they, and the, there, there was a guy sat on each side reading up above on a little ladder type of thing, one of the terrorists reading from the Quran while all these people suffered. And then they'd tell, they'd tell mothers, you know, when they'd come up and beg to let their children go out, please let at least my kids go, you know, and, and they'd say, okay, I'll tell you what, one's going to go and one's going to die, you pick. These were reading, these people reading the Quran. They, a bomb went off. Nobody knows exactly how it happened. Nobody knows if it was, because everything was rigged with bombs. We don't know whether it went off by accident or on purpose. After a couple of days, this bomb finally went off. And at that time, the Russian forces stormed the place and everybody started running and people were being killed all over the place. And, and, and there was a guy standing there in a Russian military uniform. And he was calling everybody over, come here, the kids, get over here, get away. And all the kids and all the parents and everybody else fled toward him. And when they got there, of course, he was a terrorist. And he pulled the pin on a grenade and blew himself up and all the people around him. All these children. This is Beslan. I got there. And when we drove, I mean, we saw these kids in the hospital. It was one little girl when we walked in. My, she found out it was her, her birthday. My wife started singing happy birthday to her, you know, in Russian. The American song "Happy Birthday," but singing it in Russian, she started to smile and laugh because she'd never heard it. But it was, you know, it was this funny kind of thing that, and and she loved it, and she and, and she was smiling, and the, and the lady in the back started crying, and and I said I was standing with her, and I said, "What's wrong?" And she goes, "It's the first time she's she smiled since that, this happened because, but but what she doesn't know, and I don't know how to tell her, both her mom and dad are dead, and we do not know how to tell her this yet." And we get from that hospital, I get on a plane, we get to Beslan, and I kept praying, and we had this horrible time trying to even get to the plane. The, the Russians kept trying to stop us in every single way. They did not want me to go there. I had a big wreath that the, that the uh, people of uh, uh, the United States had sent them. The embassy had it for me. I took this great big wreath, and I had all this, these things from Columbine High School, great big, huge poster from Columbine High School, signed by all these kids, telling them that of their love, and the, and. and sharing that horrible experience and telling them they knew what it was like. And I had all this stuff and I was taking it to them and we had this horrible time trying to get there and I kept praying, Lord, Lord, it's, you know, it's in your hands. I, I can't make this happen. Terrible traffic and all of a sudden the guy pulls out of the traffic and starts going down the street, going, going, going down the sidewalk and through these, you know, all over the lawns and stuff trying to get us there and we made the plane and I got there and I got off the plane and there is a, there is a, the UN there has a, a truck there, uh, and it's a armored vehicle, and I have to get into it with all this stuff. And as we're going into the city, I go past a cemetery where they're digging 600 graves in a town of 25,000 people. And I get to this place, and I see it, and it is incredible. And and there's smoke still coming up out of the ruins of this place and body parts on the wall, blood everywhere. People, it was a dead silent. And I got there and I opened this thing about Columbine High School. I started to put it up and everybody knew what Columbine was. And they came over and one of the, and the mayor of the town hugged me and he said to me in English, he said, you know, God, how did this happen? And now I tell you this story, my friends, it's in the book too, but I tell you the story because of this. When I got home, and all the way back, I kept thinking to myself, you know, there is nothing 
that says this cannot happen in the United States of America. We, we think that only in a faraway place like this could this occur. But I'm telling you, with porous borders, with a, an administration unwilling to secure this country, things like this can happen. And so I dedicated my life, not just then, but many times over and over, to doing everything I could to say, not here, no way, we're going to stop this. Now, here's the deal. Um, I believe th that General Boynton also brought this out. The fact that, oh no, I'm sorry, it was Frank Gaffney, that the fact that, uh, the fact that the president said to Senator Kyle not too long ago that he would not indeed secure our border. Knowing all of this, he would not secure our border unless the Republican Party caved in on the issue of amnesty. Now, I'm telling you, I'm going to say something again today that I've said many times, but yesterday, I don't know why it got a lot more attention than it usually did, but, but I'm going to tell you this. That kind of statement, that kind of statement, combined with the danger we face on those borders, the fact that it's not just people coming across those borders for the purpose of, you know, a job that no one else, no American will take. There are people coming across those borders dedicated to doing exactly what they did in Beslan. To a school anywhere in the United States, to a, to a mall someplace, to, a, to a, a, a nursery someplace. There are people dedicated, and he knows it. And he's saying, I will not secure the border. And I will tell you, not only do I believe with all my heart that all of the external threats to the United States pale in comparison to the threat that Barack Obama poses to this country. He is on the inside. You see, he's on the inside. He's here. He, it's, you know, the, the barbarians we say are at the gates. Hey, listen, they're here. And I'm telling you, they have more. I mean, look at the power he controls. Look at the threat that that poses to us. We can fight all these outside enemies. We're having to fight our own president. And I will tell you that that statement he made not being willing to secure our borders under the kind of threats that exist to us today, that is not just to show you that he's a threat to our way of life, to everything we believe in. I believe that's an impeachable offense. <laughs> now... <laughs> I'm, you better get ready out there. Candidates, you better get ready. <laughs> Somebody might come up and ask you whether you think Tom Tancredo's statements are, so you better plan an answer. It's all I'm telling you about right now. Huh. But, but I mean it, and it's not just because of that. It's just because of all of the things that we know to be true about this guy. He does not like America. He is going to change it. He's, going, he's devoted to changing it. I am devoted to stopping him from changing America. Let me can I just just a little bit for one more I got to ask you, Tom, how much worse is this going to get? The city of Lone Tree already doesn't want us here. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. You should have told me that earlier. I had to calm this whole thing down, of course. Um, okay. John's getting the hook. I know. All right. Look, guys. Um, just think of this, please. Ni 1944, June 6th fellow gave this speech, actually this prayer. He said, last night I, when I spoke to you about the fall of Rome, I know that was a moment, I knew at that moment that the troops of the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another great operation. It's come to pass with success thus far. And so in this poignant hour, I ask you to join with me in this prayer. This was, by the way, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, D-Day, Franklin Roosevelt is giving this prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor. And here's 
listen, please carefully to this part. A struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give them strength, give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. The prayer goes on. I don't have time, but I will tell you, no president would give this speech today. None that I know of. President what? Ted Credo would. <laughs> well, you bet I would. I, I would love to give this speech anytime, anywhere. Our republic, our religion, our civilization. Don't be afraid of, su of supporting any of those. Th Don't be afraid of extolling the virtues of all of those things to your children. It is imperative that they know we have one, a culture, yes, a religious heritage that we should be proud of. It has helped provide the greatest expansion of human freedom on the face of this earth. There is nothing to be ashamed of. We should fight for it in every avenue, in every venue we possibly can, in the, in the, the, the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan and in the battlefields of the voting booths in this country. It's worth saving, my friends. And I, I, for one, am not the least bit upset about the idea that we all in this room can indeed pray for it. God answers prayer. I believe that with all my heart. And this country and our civilization is worth your prayer. Bye-bye. Thanks. Love you. Thank you. Great.